Hello and welcome to our studios in Walsingham in England. My name is James McCullough and I'm speaking today to three guests, special guests, Bishop Stephen Lopes, who is the ordinary of the personal ordinariat of the Chair of St. Peter in North America. I have also Monsignor Keith Newton, ordinary of the personal ordinariat of Our Lady of Walsingham in the UK, and Monsignor Harry Entwistle, ordinary of the personal ordinariat of Our Lady of the Southern Cross in Australia. Welcome to our studios. Welcome to Walsingham. Thank you. Um, I think our viewers will be very interested in the origins of the ordinariat, of the whole movement. And so I'd like to start by addressing you, Bishop Stephen. Um, could you give me just a brief history of the events of early 2011 uh, that led to the establishment of the ordinariat in the UK? I might actually step back to 2009 and then let Monsignor Newton take it from 2011. Okay. 2009, uh, Pope Benedict XVI published an apostolic constitution entitled Anglicanorum Chaitibus. You have to title everything in Latin, as you know, in the church. Yes. And that simply means Anglican groups. And it was responding to several requests from different parts of the world in the UK, North America, Australia. Uh, of, of Anglican bishops and pastors together with their lay people uh, desiring to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. It's, it's something that has happened certainly uh, in many ways and at many times in the history of the Church, uh, but this was a new, uh, new framing of the question. Uh, it, was there a way for these groups of pastors and faithful, parish groups, to come into the Catholic Church as a unit, uh, preserving their relationship as, as, a, as a parish or a parochial group, and in the Catholic Church continue some of those traditions and some of those, uh, well, some of the heritage of faith and devotion and liturgy that uh, prompted them to seek the full communion of the Catholic Church in the first place. And so after some years of study and uh, some work, and some dialogues uh, that culminated in 2009 uh, with Anglicanorum Cedibus, which as a constitution is a framework, uh, a legal framework, if you will, uh, for how that might come to pass. And that framework allows for the establishment of an ordinariate, uh, which is like a non-territorial diocese. So mm -hmm. it has an ordinary, uh, every bishop in the Catholic Church is an ordinary in his diocese and it's comprised of parishes and groups and clergy and lay faithful and religious. Um, so in that most basic sense, an ordinariate is uh, a portion of the people of God, like any other diocese, just not uh, tied to one particular territory. And as uh, the Constitution was implemented, an ordinariate was erected in the UK, in North America, and in, um, and in Australia. The UK led the way in uh, early 2011, uh, with, and Monsignor Newton was very involved in that. Right. Monsignor Newton, maybe you could take up from there. Yeah, well, you can imagine we were very excited, those of us who'd longed for full communion with the Holy See. This wasn't something new, it's something we'd prayed for ever since Michael Ramsey had met Paul VI in 1966. And when this uh, apostolic constitution was published, there was a great deal of excitement, because how was it going to actually happen? So between its publication uh, and the beginning of 2011, there had to be some sort of conversations with some of our priests and groups about who would want to avail themselves of this incredibly generous, I thought, mm. uh, uh, suggestion by, by Pope Benedict XVI. And so we, we met with groups of priests and, that, and we also went to, to Rome to talk with uh, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith of how it would actually happen, how the, the practicalities would work out. And we set a timetable of what would happen. And it began by uh, the ordin my ordination together with two other uh, uh, priests in the Catholic Church who had all previously been Anglican bishops. And, and which date was that? That was on the 15th of January 2011. Right. I, was, I, I, I had to resign, of course, from my post. I was a bishop mm. in the Church of England. And I resigned towards on, uh, on, th on the... Uh, 31st December 2010, mm -hmm. I was received the following day in Westminster Cathedral together with these other two bishops and with my wife mm. and another wife uh, of one of the other bishops. And then two weeks later, we were ordained in, the, uh, in Westminster Cathedral by uh, the Archbishop uh, Nichols. And, um, 
and then it was announced that I was going to be the ordinary, that is, the person with jurisdiction over this new structure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with, so it began just with, with a, a small number of people, uh, together with three sisters, actually, mm -hmm. from the Priory at Wals the Anglican Priory at Walsingham. Yes. They were also received uh, at Westminster Cathedral. And then two weeks later, just over two weeks later, I think it was, I was, I was ordained priest, having been ordained deacon a few days before, mm -hmm. together with my two colleagues. But of course, that was that was just the ordinary. It was just made up of of, uh, of priests and a few religious and, and mm. two wives. Right. Um, then we had to have the, the the plan of how how the the pastors were going to be received. So so mm. we it was all laid out in the plans we had, mm. which was for them to resign on Ash Wednesday, just before Ash Wednesday, mm. and from Ash Wednesday uh, through to uh, about Easter Day, they together with their people would be catechised, prepared for reception um, uh, in, into the full communion of the Catholic Church. And then around Easter time, they were received mm -hmm. uh, and became full Catholics. In the and during that time also, from Ash Wednesday, going on after Easter to Pentecost, the priests had a, an intensive program of formation, mm -hmm. to, which led to their ordination, first the diaconate and then to the priesthood, around about the, mid the summer of 2011. Mm. This was very rapid, of course, but the whole point of it was that they were bringing people and they need to, to maintain that relationship, that pastoral relationship right. that they had with their people who they were bringing into the Catholic Church. Right. Now, their formation didn't finish then. There was then a, another two-year program uh, which went on, but they were already priests. Mm. And then the, the, this continued. I mean, not enormous numbers, but the first, uh, uh, the first group, about 60 priests were ordained mm -hmm. in 2011 for the ordinaries of Our Lady of Walsingham. Right. And how many lay parishioners came across at that time? It was about 1,200. 1,200, yeah. so not an insignificant number. No, no. Uh, this is a quite a rapid period of, uh, or rather quite a lot of uh, events going on within that small space of oh, time. Oh, it, it was. It was very exciting, as you very can imagine. Exciting. We had about 20 ordinations. So <laughs> I, I know the ordination right well, better than most bishops, <laughs> I think. I did it by heart. I've been to so many. Yes. And t what sort of sense of significance did you have during this time? Well, I just thought this was totally unique for, for me and for most of my priests. This was a fulfilment of, of, of prayer over many, many years. You know, we could hardly believe that it actually happened, that we pray for unity of the Catholic Church. Mm. See, one of, one of the problems seems to me often is that, that all we do is talk. Mm. We talk about unity. We may pray for it, but, when, mm. but, but how many practical uh, situations have you seen where they've been, you know, it's actually happened? Sure. And in fact, I think probably the ordinary is the only real ecumenical fruit which has come from Vatican II, and you know now it's there. Yes, uh, there are other cases in the Eastern churches where they've been united with uh, with mm. the Holy See, but this is the first time that a, a group which was forged in the years of the Reformation yes. has right. has come back into full communion with the Holy See. I see. And Monsignor Keith, what were the reactions that you gauged from various groups at the time, whether Roman Catholic or otherwise? Well, I, I think it was varied in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, mm. there was a lot of excitement by, from some people, uh, saying this was the fulfilment of dreams that they prayed for as well. I mean, the many Catholics who pray for unity. Yes. Um, and there were others who found it difficult, you know, and, and said, mm. well, why can't you just become a proper Catholic? Meaning, why can't you just join a diocese? Mm. Um, and I think many Catholics in England and Wales, and about the rest of the world, have a very limited view of, of the Catholic Church. It's much more diverse than many people realise it is. Yes. Um, so, so uh, people had to be educated, and still we have to educate people about the, 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 signif the ecumenical significance of the ordinaries. As far as the Church of England was concerned, it, again, it varied. Some, some uh, were, were upset that we left, um, felt that we, we perhaps betrayed the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Others uh, could see that, 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 that those of us who are finding difficulties with the doctrinal diversity in the Church of England uh, it, it's moral laxity and um, uh, questions about the order in terms of women's ordination, both as priests and bishops in the Church of England, that there was no way we could stay in, with any integrity. Right. So, uh, so, so many people said, well, perhaps this is the right way forward. So it was very varied. You couldn't say that there was just one lot, mm. one, one, one view. 
And have some of those views evolved since that time over these years? Yes, I think there's much more acceptance that this is part of the, uh, of the Catholic Church. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I've seen some people change their views about it because it's, you know, once something's been there and is bedded down, it's mm. accepted in more ways. I still think we have a, a, a very important educational role to play in mm. telling people and educating people because the, only those who get to know an ordinary group, and we're quite scattered, I mean, you know, it's even more mm. scattered in mm. the States and in, uh, in Australia. Unless you know a group and people, you're not know, going to know about it. Right, right. Monsignor Harry, um, following on from that last point, what would you say to Roman Catholics who might comment along the lines of, why don't the ordinary act just become uh, normal Roman Catholics in the Latin Rite? Well, that's a, actually a very common question that we have all faced and we are continu continually asked. Uh, and at one sense, it, 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 it is a reasonable question. But in asking that, I don't think they have quite grasped what the ordinary is really about. The long history of the attempts of reunion between the Church in England and then the Church of England with Rome uh, after the Reformation, uh, has a long history beginning at the, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, when she was invited to send bishops to the closing sessions of uh, the Council of Trent. She refused, of course, mm. uh, and was later uh, excommunicated. But that was the first attempt, because the idea was Rome might consider the Book of Common Prayer, or the prayer book in England at that time, as a basis for union. Then there were very serious attempts uh, in the reign of James I, and later in the reign of J uh, Charles II, in which very clear plans were, were actually formulated of um, the Archbishop becoming almost the Patriarch of England. And, uh, uh, the liturgy uh, in English and uh, or in Latin with English hymns and so on and the clergy uh, would be able to continue uh, in their parishes if they were willing to subject themselves to reordination. Mm -hmm. So reordination has been part of uh, even very historically the, the whole of the uh, requirements and the need to demonstrate full Christian unity. And then, later on, uh, in 1833, the Church of England was in quite a dire straits. Uh, so much so that Thomas Arnold, the uh, headmaster of the uh, revamped rugby school, said, um, the Church of England as it now stands, no human hand can save. Right. Yet, <laughs> pretty drastic. Yes. Yet, in 30, 1833, that was the beginning of the, the greatest missionary expansionism the world had ever known. It was the beginning of the evangelical movement, and it was also the birth of the Oxford movement. Uh, John Henry, blessed John Henry Newman and Keeble and Pusey and so on. And so that Oxford movement rekindled the idea of unity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I can't quite remember the day, uh, the, the date, but at the first Lambeth Conference of the Bishops of England, there was a petition uh, given to them, uh, given to the bishops, to ask them to end their separation from Rome. And so it went on, and in the 1920s, uh, there was a Moline conversations in which Lord Halifax was uh, part of. And out of that, those talks came the phrase, unity without absorption. Mm -hmm. And so that became almost the catchphrase. That seemed to be the, the goal. Right. Unity without absorption. As time went on, and Archbishops of Canterbury, and uh, Geoffrey Fisher visited visited the Pope, and then the famous uh, meeting was in 1966 between Archbishop Ramsey and Pope Paul VI, in which 
rings were exchanged and great fraternity and so on. And talk of sister church. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so the impetus was on. Those of us who were in the Church of England at the time, and Senior Newton and myself, we all thought, unity next week, you know, it's all on. Mm. We were all terribly excited about it. But for all kinds of reasons, um, it didn't happen. Uh, but there were remnants, and there are, were, were members of the Church of England who still held up the idea of unity without absorption, mm. with distinctiveness. Mm. And so that is what came to pass. That's what happened with Anglican Orum Chetibus. Holy Father Benedict XVI recognized that you cannot bring Anglicans into unity, into full communion with Rome, and ignore the heritage and the tradition which had shaped them over the past 400 years. Right. Obviously, that tradition, we have to become fully Catholic, and that means accepting the catechism as the true ex expression of the true Catholic faith at this time. Uh, and uh, that is what we, we have done. And like the attempts earlier on, we have submitted ourselves in holy and humble obedience to uh, reordination into the Catholic priesthood. But somebody once asked me, you know, uh, just after an ordination of one of my priests, whether, um, whether we were really Catholic priests. So I said, well, if a Catholic bishop is in the habit of ordaining a non-Catholic priest, then we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so right. that was the point. Uh, so really, the answer to the question is, if we had become normal, what is normal, though I don't know quite what that means, mm -hmm. but I mean diocesan Catholics, we would have been absorbed. And the whole purpose of those unity attempts was unity without absorption. Mm -hmm. And that is what the ordinariat is. Yes. Unity with distinctiveness. And, and after all, the concept of unity without absorption is present in the existence of, say, the Melkite Catholics, Absolutely. the Syro-Malabar rites, yes. which are individual rites. Or the other, uh, other liturgies, the Dominican. Yeah. Absolutely. So on, so. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so I really wanted to ask now about um, the mission of the Ordinariat Movement. And, and may I ask uh, Bishop Stephen again, uh, what is the Ordinariat's role in the new evangelization? Sure. Uh, I, I think you can, you can look at that mission in two ways, but it arises uh, out of what Monsignor Harry has just said. If, if the Apostolic Constitution, Anglican Arm Chedibus, understands and accepts into the full communion of the Catholic Church this diverse way of living, expressing, and celebrating the faith, then the mission of the Ordinariate is at once external and internal. It's external as an ecumenical vision. As it says to uh, Anglicans and indeed Protestants and other non-Catholics, to enter into full communion with the Catholic Church does not mean that you have to park at the door of the Church everything that you knew that brought you to that point, mm -hmm. but that there is a, there is a way, if that's, in cons if that's consistent with the Catholic faith, then that can be celebrated and lived within Catholic communion. Right. So, at once, the mission of the Ordinariate is invitational. Mm -hmm. It's about reaching out to, to others and inviting them into the adventure of full communion that so many of our lay people and clergy have, uh, have embarked upon. A joyful thing to come to the fullness uh, of Catholic communion, to embrace uh, something true about the Church of Christ, and uh, to desire that others uh, share that with you is, I think, a noble mission and a very ecumenical one. Hmm. At the same time, the Apostolic Constitution, uh, Anglicanorum Chedibus, that we had talked about earlier, uh, talks about all of those gifts that are brought forward uh, using the word patrimony, hmm. a, a spiritual, a, a, um, an intellectual, a pastoral, and a liturgical patrimony. And the patrimony 
what is that meant to do in the Catholic Church? Well, two things. It nourishes the faith of the members of the ordinariate. Okay. That, that we've discovered that the way the faith uh, was lived and expressed in an English context, I mean, what the ordinariate brings to bear is that full and rich tradition of English Christianity is attractive, it's fresh, it's new, and it, it, it allows people to engage the faith and the truth of the faith in the midst of a world that is at times very inimicable to that faith. Mm. Um, and so it's nourishing uh, to the people who are in the ordinariate. But then the Apostolic Constitution goes on where it talks about nourishing the faith of the members of the ordinariate as a treasure to be shared. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's that wonderful Article 3, that's how it ends. Well, shared with whom? Of course, our brothers and sisters uh, in the Catholic Church. Right. That there's something about this that will be immediately familiar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you, as a, as a cradle Catholic, go into an ordinariate parish where we're celebrating our, our, our proper ordinary liturgy, you will recognize it immediately as the Mass. Mm -hmm. It's the Mass. Ah, but, okay, they do this a little bit differently. They say that a little bit differently. Now, what's that prayer that they're all kneeling down and saying over there? Uh, we don't have that bit in our liturgy. You see, there's that, there's that other idiom, that other expression that arises out of a proper English tradition, uh, and, and it, can, it can allow people to hear and express the faith in a new and different way and in an attractive way. So it's meant in a certain sense to enliven also the experience of parish life. I think uh, that's what, what Monsignor was alluding to uh, before when he said, look, it's not just liturgy, mm -hmm. it's how we live parish life in the ordinary. That's, that's also attractive for a lot of cradle Catholics. That there's, there's an insight there uh, to the relationship between clergy and faithful, to the relationship of the faithful with each other and the responsibility uh, that faithful take for each other, that can be an enrichment to the Catholic Church. So uh, it is a, a mission of enrichment and an enrichment of invitation because ultimately uh, what the whole ecumenical drive should be um, going back even to our Lord's Prayer, you know, the night before he died, that they all might be one. Why? So that the world might believe. Father, that you sent me. You know, mm -hmm. that there is a credibility to Christianity when, uh, when there is unity. And mm -hmm. so, how do we serve the new evangelization? Well, these are men and women who have embraced unity, and therefore they give credibility to the proclamation of the faith that is attractive. I understand. And are there other, any other traditions you uh, mentioned about um, enriching the liturgy? What other traditions have you brought into the Catholic Church? I think you'll find a, uh, a particular richness towards the prayer of the Divine Office. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is interestingly, uh, I think the ordinariates here are, are very much in service to the express desire of the Second Vatican Council uh, that the prayer of the Divine Office be the prayer of the Church because right. the Council was responding to at least the impression, if not the reality, that uh, the prayer of the Divine Office, morning and evening prayer, the breviary, had become the prayer of specialists in the Church, mm. priests, religious women, monks, you know, but it was totally absent from the reality of most lay Catholics. Right. Whereas in the ordinariate communities, uh, drawing again on that, um, that, that tradition of the divine office being a parochial office, that morning prayer and evening prayer are prayed out loud in church, you know, every day mm. as, as something properly belonging to the faithful. Yes. Well, you know, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a contribution. And you add to that, that so much of that uh, absolutely exquisite uh, English sacred music grew yes. up not even, well, not so much in the context of the Mass, but in the Divine Office. Yes. Office hymns and anthems and, and what. Mm -hmm. It's where uh, the musical tradition also is given full breath. So, you know, if find an ordinary parish and go to choral evensong, 
Mm. And you'll see what I mean. Right. I know that that's something that sprung to mind. Very interesting. When I, I had an interview soon after my ordination with Pope Benedict, yes. and we spent at least ten minutes talking about Anglican Evensong, yeah. which he thought right. was a beauty to be brought back into the into Catholic practice because he he, he he rather lamented that Vespers yeah. had disappeared, some Vespers on the Sunday. Yes, I look forward to the experiencing yeah, that myself. Yeah. Can I add one thing to the new language, which is probably specific to to England uh, uh, and Wales, rather, I'm, I'm not sure it'd be true for uh, uh, America or Australia, but within the Anglican Church, Anglican uh, parish priests have responsibility for everybody who lives mm -hmm. in that parish. Mm -hmm. So evangelization is, is all those people need to learn about our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's slightly frustrating when I listen to in it, certainly here, about new evangelization, it really is concentrating often on trying to get lapsed Catholics back to, back to Mass. Mm. Now that's important, I'm, I'm not saying, it's, of course it's, it's really important, but we have a wider mission, you know, the, mm. the, the Great Commission wasn't just to lapsed Catholics, it was to everybody out there. Sure. And so I think the ordinary has a way of reminding the Church that we have this greater commission, which is wider than just those who have lapsed from the faith. Right. How can we support this mission? Ordinary, it is not an easy word, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so when, when, when you're, you're at a clergy event or even at, a, at an event, a larger diocesan event in the life of the church and you say, hi, I'm Bishop Lopes from the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, mm -hmm. you know, immediately there's that kind of glazed, uh, glazed look, you know, um, fine. But, you know, this is, this is a, a, a rather exciting contribution, I think. Uh, to the vitality of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just as, you know, all Catholics would routinely want to continue their own faith education uh, to deepen their relationship with the Lord and His Church, um, you know, a few minutes on Google will tell you uh, a lot about the ordinary, as Absolutely. it turns out. And that, that's already a big support. Well, it, yeah. that's interesting. We, we, on our first pilgrimage to the Holy Land, uh, going up Mount Tabor, coming down from Mount Tabor, my wife was sitting in the back of a car because she got mixed up with some priests from the Philippines who knew nothing about the ordinaries, right. and she was right. explaining about it. And when we got home, I got an email from one of them. He got onto Google, he looked it all up. He said, yep. "This is fantastic, you know. <laughs> this is what some of us have been praying for." <laughs> Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. that's really good to hear. So, communication about who we are is yeah. is one of the challenges, and uh, this interview today. I mean, I hope we'll bring some knowledge to many people about who Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, very enlightening for myself. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and Bishop Stephen, how has your own background helped in maybe unifying the ordinariats across the world? Mm. Uh, I am not a former Anglican. I think that's what you mean. I'm, yes. a, I'm, a, I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, and so I've come into this. Uh, I was working in Rome at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, at the time that these conversations were beginning in 2007 up through the Apostolic Constitution uh, until my own appointment uh, as Bishop in the Ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter uh, announced in November of 2015. The, the, the Anglican patrimony, uh, well, the patrimony of English Christianity really is, is, is not something you so much learn as you live. Right. And I have been enormously privileged uh, uh, to be able to live this expression of Catholic life uh, with my priests and people, uh, both at the Cathedral Parish in Houston, Texas, where I live, but in all of the parishes I, I go to, um, it, it's something we do together. In other words, I wouldn't want someone to think that this is just some sort of intellectual exercise, that, mm. that, that this, this patrimony we're talking about is just about a way of celebrating Mass and just about a way of, of, of using you know, strange words like vouchsafe uh, <laughs> or, or, or something like this. Um, but it really is a, um, a much more holistic way of living out the faith mm. um, that has challenged me has challenged certain uh, preconceived notions of what it means to be Catholic, uh, of what it means to do the Catholic thing. Um, you know, when, when I'm, I'm gentle when I encounter people that, that, you know, well, why don't you just become an ordinary Catholic? You know, to be Catholic means to do this thing, because I mm. was one of those, you know, right. in a certain yes. sense. 
So uh, allowing myself first to be challenged uh, by this way of living and to embrace it uh, has been has been really significant for me. It helps me pray better, I think, first of all. But, mm. Uh, mm. Okay. I think he, he, he has a really important role in this, actually, because as I understand the idea of, of receptive yeah. uh, acu ecumenism, mm -hmm. it's about recognizing in some other denominations good things. Not mm -hmm. saying, I've got good things mm -hmm. I can give you, mm -hmm. but actually saying, you've got good things you can yeah, share with the wider yeah. church. Mm -hmm. So when right. people ask me about what's this patrimony, I really say, well, you tell me what you see that's of value. Yes. So the fact that Bishop Stephen does not come from an Anglican background, he has an objective way of saying, these are the things I've seen. Yes. Rather than me, mm. rather, rather right. in a mm. superior way saying, oh, we bring this. Somebody who comes from, the, from, from an ordinary, as it were, Dawson Catholic mm, yeah, yeah, and say, yeah. I can see these gifts in the church yeah, right. which you're bringing. Mm, yeah, and yeah, that's right. what it should be. It's not us saying, this is what we've brought. It's for those who experience mm. to say, yeah, Actually, the preaching is much more biblically centred, or yes, the yes, hymnody is yes. more beautiful, or whatever. And yes. this, is, this is actually what's drawing cradle Catholics to, to make their spiritual home, you know, in ordinary mm -hmm. parishes. Yeah. And I would say, uh, too, you know, when we talk about cradle Catholics in the ordinary, well, there will come a day, and in fact in the United States the day has already come, when mm -hmm. many in the ordinary at our cradle Catholics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At least three of our parishes in the United States um, draw on the tradition of the pastoral provision. Mm -hmm. you know, so John Paul II in 1983 began uh, allowing a parish structure, a parish to come into full communion and to continue a wor to worship in a certain way. Uh, so that our parish in Houston, a parish in San Antonio, a parish up in North Texas, they have been Catholic parishes for over 30 years which means you're no longer talking just about those who have come into full communion, mm -hmm. but now you're talking about the fact that their children are adults. And so, you know, we have many, uh, many uh, actually at the cathedral parish, for example, who have been born and raised into this expression of church life, who've known no other way of being Catholic. They're simply ca cradle Catholics nurtured in this, uh, in this ordinary tradition. Right, thank you. Um, and I'm very interested by the, if you like, the global reach of the ordinary at its, its locations and so on. And uh, maybe uh, Monsignor Harry, if you could uh, tell me, I, I, I hear that you have some fairly remote congregations. Mm. Um, could you enlighten us? Yes. Well, yeah, remote. I mean, in one sense, Australia is remote. And certainly the com communities that we have are spread right round the coast. And so we measure the, the distance between communities in terms of flying time rather than driving time. So, for example, I live in Perth and the nearest community uh, to me, the nearest priest to, to where um, I am, is two and a half hours flight away. Right. You see. So this is the kind of thing uh, you have. So. It is remote, and that, that presents all kinds of challenges of communication, of building up a sense of uh, fellowship, of belonging to a non-geographical diocesan structure. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if your um, ordinary lives, you know, eight, six, seven thousand kilometers away, I mean, <laughs> something <laughs> like that, uh, well, not quite that. Uh, but we also have a parish on a very small island, um, one of the Torres Strait Islands, which mm. are the group of islands uh, that exist between the tip of Cape York, the, the, the ear of the rabbit, you know, the, yes. that side of the east, and Papua New Guinea. Right. But for, uh, also for um, historical reasons that are best known to the Japanese, <laughs> uh, two communities uh, from the Anglican Church in Japan, who became part of the tradition of a traditional Anglican communion, uh, have become ordinariate uh, communities connected to Australia. So, in fact, I, I have two communities in Japan. That's remarkable. So um, that's a, there are there maybe three thousand miles yeah. or almost <laughs> or more. And we get yes. better. Okay. Yeah. There is a group of um, Filipinos. Uh, again, former Anglicans or uh, in, in independent Anglican communion who really are meeting, gathering together, saying evensong together, because there's no priest there, saying evensong together 
and really are working and looking for uh, to become part of an ordinariate in, in Australia, so right. the Philippines. And then uh, laity, individual laity in, in New Zealand are, you know, asking questions. Yes. So yes, yes. where this ends, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it must present some practical problems uh, about visiting well, your let's say, congregation. Let's say that Qantas and I are very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all three of us can be, be chaplains to the air and rail around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just tell me, for example, how do you get to your Torres Strait Islanders? Ah, well, if I started in Perth, which is on the western coast of Australia, on the Indian Ocean, yes, I. The, the easiest way for me to get there is to get a flight from Perth to Alice Springs, right. which is right in the middle of Australia. Then you change planes and go from Alice Springs to Cairns on the other side. And then from Cairns you get another flight up to one, uh, the, one of the larger islands in the Torres Strait where the airport is. It's not the largest island, but it just happens to be where the airport is. Then you climb onto a nine-seater plane uh, and go for a 20-minute flight onto an island called Saibai. Now remember these islands, the, the population just lives right around the coastline. I mean, it's really virtually on mm. the sand mm. because most of it was part of the great uh, Australian divide, the, the, the mountains, volcano, hills. Uh, so you get there. And then you get off this nine-seater plane, walk down to the sea, and hope that <laughs> Tommy or Billy or Joe from the other <laughs> island has come across with his aluminium dinghy, his aluminium boat, with his outboard mo motor at the back. And so you clamber into that and yeah. somehow get your luggage into it. And then he'll take you across for another five k's and then just pull, drive straight up onto the beach, uh, which is at his back door of his house. You see. Mm. And that's how mm. you get there. Uh, I see. So you're clocking up quite cost, a few loyalty. <laughs> the cost is enormous yeah. in the sense that it costs more, almost more, for me to get to uh, from Perth to Duan mm. than it does to fly to Europe and London. Oh, really. So Mm -hmm. yeah. The the huge yeah. cost is in that little bit from Horn Island in the nine seater mm -hmm. uh, to Sinai. The cost, and that makes it difficult. Yes. Um, and our priest lives in Cairns, and so he can get up there, um, you know, several times a year. But we also last year we ordained uh, for the first ever. Torres Strait Islander into the Catholic diaconate, into the transitional diaconate. Mm. And I am hoping and praying that, that that man will be ordained priest very soon. And so the really the, the key to evangelization in places like the Torres Strait is to have an indigenous ministry. That's mm. what the Anglicans did when they first evangelized the Torres Strait. They created an indigenous ministry. And when you have these differing, very differing cultures, you really have to have clergy and priests who understand the culture, are part of the culture, are accepted by uh, the others you know, within that culture. Because mm -hmm. the way, and again, the, the way the, the gospel is communicated and how it is communicated is, is a very cultural thing. Mm, mm. It's the same gospel, and so there again is a, is a minor form of distinctiveness. Right. And so it is important uh, that your normal Catholics, as they call themselves, mm. understand the diversity of the whole Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is universal, mm. and cultures mm. galore. Absolutely. The way it is. But that, that's, that's the remote. It's, it's yeah. easier to fly to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so, touching on a theme that we covered earlier, um, I want to come back and explore this idea of um, ec ec ecumenism 
some onlookers, some viewers might be thinking, well, is this just an ecumenical gesture? Or is it, as Pope Benedict has said, a move towards the restoration of full ecclesial communion? So maybe continuing with yourself, Monsignor Harry, what would you say, what would you envisage is the longer term impact of the establishment of the ordinariate? Well, the ordinariate is the result. It is what, what is called realized ecumenism. Yeah. Hmm. In, in other words, this, what the ordinariate is, is what true unity without absorption looks like. If you want to grasp, you know, people can pray for unity, but what do you mean? Do you mean intercommunion, yet business as usual, believing what you like, you know, as though there is no and nothing changes? Or are you serious about being in full Catholic unity? with the Holy Father and, and, the, and the Church Universal, with the Sea of Peter. What our Lord prayed for was his disciples might be one, maybe one. Not because this is all nice and a very lovely idea, but in order that the world may believe. Mm. And as uh, Bishop Lope said earlier, that is the point. Mm -hmm. A divided church is weakened in its mission and its ministry. A united church uh, holding the same faith, expressing it in different ways, uh, in culturally and, and, and in different formats, um, is, is strong. And so what I would say is if you, uh, anyone who is serious about what would true unity look like, this is the model. Mm -hmm. We are on the front row. Look at us, and what you see is true Christian unity. Right. Yes. Monsignor Keith, do you have anything to add? Well, only I, I think that the, the Apostolic Constitution was, I think, a fruit of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. If that had not happened, we wouldn't be at that point where it was possible for, that, for the Catholic Church to see there, are, there were elements within Anglicanism that were, 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 which were similar, enough similarity, that there was a point where we could become Catholics and bring some of our traditions in. So it was, it was, a, it was a fruit of all that ecumenical works, the only fruit actually of, the, of, of those archic conversations. It's both that and it's what Pope Benedict said is prophetic. Yes. So it looks to the future of what may be possible for other people to enter uh, the Catholic Church, bringing something of their traditions, as long as the, 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 they, they are commensurate with the, the doctrines and teachings of the Catholic Church, mm. but to bring those other traditions, which are either secondary, uh, not doctrinal, but the, the, the perhaps spiritual, pastoral, liturgical, whatever. So it looks to that possibility. Now, I, I think ecumenists should be really excited by this. Mm. Even if they, have, they can be critical about it, they should say, this is really interesting for the ecumenical movement. Unfortunately, I don't think they always see that, which, which surprises me. And it often seems to me uh, that ecumenism has become, the ecumenism of being nice to each other. Mm. Well, that's important. It's better than not being nice to each other, but again, it's not what our Lord prayed for. Or the ecumenism of dialogue. But dialogue has to have a goal, and the goal has to be corporate union, that we are members of one church, you know, where well, we have this diversity, but I can go to any Catholic church in the world and can celebrate as a priest. Yes. Right. And, and I think this, uh, what you've just heard from, from my two brothers here, uh, is the why of a structure. Mm -hmm. Why did Pope Benedict XVI uh, create a structure? Why did Pope Francis uh, enrich or strengthen that structure with the promulgation of the Missal, uh, the appointment of a bishop and things like this. Because, you know, you, we've heard the phrase, you know, used several times, unity without absorption. Mm -hmm. uh, another way of saying what is the ecumenical vision of Anglicanorum Chaitibus and the Ordinariates is that the unity of Catholic faith allows for a diversity of the expression of that faith. What, what creating this structure, what is meant to be a permanent structure in the church. Um, so this is not some sort of little ghetto that, you know, you, this is how you get some people to join the Catholic Church and then once they've done so, 
you know, yeah. But it's meant, it's meant to give space, uh, to allow these proper traditions that have been nourishing the church, both within full communion and outside of it, that have been nourishing the faith for hundreds of years in a particular cultural, social, and religious context that we would call English Christianity, mm -hmm. to find new voice and to find uh, uh, new context in full communion. And that will be a lasting impact. You know, uh, we, can, we can see it in the way that we're educating our children, we can see it in the way that we are uh, retaining and augmenting uh, certain spiritual liturgical uh, traditions and practices, that this is going to be something that continues to resound to the glory of God and to the vitality of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, uh, Monsignor Keith, what does Borsinger mean for you as an ordinary act? Well, you, you have to remember that, that uh, within England, uh, Wales and maybe Scotland, um, Many of the people who came to the ordinaries were from an Anglo-Catholic background. They, mm. they, they practiced a, a, a faith which had many elements of Catholicism in it. And this was the spiritual home. All Anglo-Catholics love Walsingham. They love Our Lady, the great tradition uh, that's been here, the, the history of Hope the Vicar, Hope Patton, mm. uh, re-establishing re the shrine in the Anglican parish church and then building the Anglican shrine. The finding, the, the, the buying of the, or, uh, of the Slipper Chapel, which mm. became the, the, uh, the National Catholic Shrine of Our Lady here in Walsingham. These were very, very important things for us. And I, did no, have no, I had no idea the day I was ordained, there was a letter written by um, uh, Cardinal Levader, who was then the Prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, announcing the erection of the first ordinariate, uh, and that I would be the first ordinary, and he announced the name Our Lady Walsingham, and there was a sort of emotional, uh, you know, sigh around the cathedral that the, the, the Holy See had given us that name, mm -hmm. and also across across the world. I mean, the, the, it's amazing how many uh, churches in America are actually called after Our Lady Walsingham, and in fact, mm -hmm. uh, Bishop mm -hmm. Stephen can tell mm -hmm. you that My his cathedral. cathedral is Our Lady of Walsingham. In fact, right. we have a, uh, a replica of that very arch out there. Uh, <laughs> so I heard, yes. In the, in the center of our cathedral campus. And that, I think, uh, what Monsignor Keith has just said, I would just echo. Walsingham and the, the uh, Our Lady's Holy House, and all of that means in terms of the domestic church and uh, Mary really as with the people and mm. praying for the people and amongst the people, that really is the spiritual center of, uh, of, of our ordinariate, which is why at the Cathedral Parish we have the Shrine of Walsingham in the physical center of our campus. That's wonderful. I mean, we have one community that's called Our Lady of Walsingham. Mm. But of course, our ordinariate is Our Lady of the Southern Cross, which yes. is an alternative name for Our Lady Help of Christians. And so it's the Marian connection. It's that, um, and it's there throughout all three of, of the ordinaries. Mm, and, mm, uh, wonderful. So for us, Walsingham is almost the mother house, as yeah. it were, in a sense. And, uh, but Our Lady of the Southern Cross, Our Lady of Help of Christians, is that kind of sustaining, powerful image of Our Lady, you know, the strong woman who, you know, presents Christ to the world. Mm, mm, wonderful. Mm. Uh, Bishop Stephen, Monsignors, thank you for coming to Walsingham. Thank you for speaking for us. Um, and also, we pray for God's blessing in your work. Mm. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.